I'm Lucy Bernholtz. I'm recording this on May 30th, 2020 in Northern California on the land of the Ohlone and coastal Miwok peoples. I was asked to prepare these remarks back in April and I started my writing several weeks ago, but I put off recording this because of what I was writing. When I received the invitation, I remember thinking that it was a tiny reflection of exactly what I feared, that by inviting me, a middle-aged white woman, educated, employed at a university, with food, shelter, clean water, and broadband, was as sure a sign as any that our collective response to a public health crisis was likely to be different for me than for most. It's going to be very different for Black people, for people of color, and Indigenous people, for people who have some jobs as compared to those people who have other jobs, for those people who benefited from and continue to support policies and laws that build justice, educational, health, and employment systems that destroy both people and the planet. I feared then, and I'm seeing now, that even a non-human pathogen isn't going to be enough for us to focus on our common vulnerabilities. Six weeks ago, when I was invited to speak, I was afraid that we wouldn't be seeing anything new. And now I'm recording this on a weekend when the pain and anger of living in a racist and unjust society is bringing us into the streets, even as we know of the biological dangers of being in close proximity with others. And we're only at the beginning of this. Whatever it's next, its roots are here in the very brokenness of this now. I've organized these thoughts in three parts. The first is about this idea of newness, the second is about digital civil society. And in the third, I'll try to offer some observations specifically for arts and, the, and artists. So first, my thoughts on newness. I'm an historian. I was trained to find patterns, to tell stories, and to examine my own blind spots. What do I not see? Who am I not hearing from? Because historians rely mostly on the written word, we focus on the few people who recorded their lives. And so we're prone to a very skewed sense of who lives, who dies, and who tells the stories. We have to assume our stories are incomplete. We have to ask, who's not here? This matters now in what may be a world shifting moment. I was asked for my thoughts, but I don't speak for the people whose lives have already been touched by the disease and unemployment, although I may join them at any time. And I can only speak to racism as a white person. And my thoughts here are not profound. Racism defines our country, our systems, our current moment. We can only change that by seeing it, committing to an anti-racist future, actively and comprehensively pursuing reconciliation and repair. As an historian, I've been trained to ask why things happen when they do. And I've learned that we don't know the answer to that until the new things become old. Distingu distinguishing between what is superficially new and what will be meaningful and lasting only happens in retrospect. Collectively, we won't know what's new about this moment until we look back at it and the new has become the old. Now that's not true for individuals. A new normal won't just happen. We will create it. It's an accumulation of our individual choices. What we're experiencing now collectively is old, not new. Our systems are failing now because of decades of political and financial choices built on centuries of racism. Changing that is on each and every one of us. Number two, some thoughts on digital civil society. In 2010, some colleagues and I went looking for the new. We asked ourselves, what's changing about nonprofits and philanthropy? What's new? My interest in the question in that particular moment was sparked by the Supreme Court's 2010 decision in the Citizens United case. I thought the decision would fundamentally change the nonprofit sector. Most everyone else who was writing about it at the time was focused on its impact on political campaigns. I agreed with their concerns, but I was looking at something else. 
It seemed to me then that a wall between two systems, two different sets of values, was about to be breached. The wall was between charity and politics. One system, charitable giving, was designed to encourage unlimited participation and it privileges anonymity. The other, political giving, had been structured with individual limits and requirements on disclosure. The court decision was going to make breaching the wall between the two too tempting to ignore. The lure of being able to direct large amounts of money into politics through the adjacent system of charity, which also conveniently provided a way to wash away the donor's identities, was going to be so strong, it seemed to me like the path to abuse was clearly marked. And that, I thought, wasn't going to work out well. I changed my life to pursue this question. I sold a company and returned to academia. I'll spare you the details of the next few years and cut to the chase. For three years, we tried to answer that question. What changes in charitable and political action really mattered? In this weird space we call civil society, this psychic and privileged realm outside of governments and markets, what's really different? For three years, we looked at things like money in politics, impact investing, new philanthropic forms, even organ donations. And we learned slowly that each of these innovations mattered, but none were the real root of change. These were mushrooms in a new soil. And that soil, the thing the mushrooms all shared, was digital dependence. We operate our daily lives now in the liminal space between digital systems and physical spaces. Broadband, cell phones, video software, it's how this conference is happening. We ignore the political economy of this digital infrastructure at our own peril. Because the digital systems we rely on are commercially created and government surveilled. They're not neutral, public, democracy supporting, or free. This is a problem. Democracy leads rely on some space where we can express ourselves, come together peacefully, create alternatives that governments and markets won't provide. And to do this, there needs to be a way to have a private conversation, to think without being observed, to choose with whom you associate and where. In digital spaces, all of those activities are seen and watched and stored and analyzed by others. When we stopped looking at the mushrooms and started sifting through the soil, we had to stop looking at institutions and start asking about first principles. To move from form to function. What's the purpose of civil society and democracies? Why did we invent nonprofits and foundations in the first place? What's worth keeping? And what can be updated or gotten rid of? What can we invent now that will serve the first principles and use the digital capacities productively and democratically. We went looking for new things and found old ones. We stopped looking at forms and focused on functions. And we realized that digital civil society, this idea of a digitally dependent space for voluntary action, one where we can use private resources, both analog and digital, for public benefit, doesn't yet exist. It was a circuitous route from concerns about campaign finance to deeply understanding the challenges that digital dependencies present for democracies. We may look at the mushrooms, the surface level changes, and think that they matter. But what really matters is not the mushrooms, but the soil in which they grow. This experience repeats itself over and over again. When we get together to think about the present and future of the arts, I hope we'll distinguish between the mushrooms and the soil. We're seeing a new permutation of jobs, health services, educational experiments, and political platforms right now. I think these are mushrooms. We need to keep our eyes on the soil. Why am I telling you all this? Because in our pursuit of understanding, we went looking for new in all the wrong places. We went looking for something and instead found the empty space that that something needs to fill. 
There isn't a digital civil society that's just happening. We need to imagine it, to cultivate it, to bring it into being. And I think this will be true. Perhaps it's always been true for artists and the arts. So let me turn now to some thoughts on artists and the arts. The first two parts of this brief talk, I've tried to give you a sense of how I think, because I don't know what the future holds, but I do watch and think about a wide variety of things that are happening now, what might be thought of as ingredients that I'll offer to you here for your own scenario planning or debate or discussion. But I wanna be clear, these are observations in a moment. They may matter individually, but a new normal will depend on what we do with them their recombinant possibilities and the collective imaginaries we choose to pursue from this moment on. So here are some thoughts or observations more likely. It's notable that the diverse economic supports adjacent to the arts that individual artists rely on for an income separate from their art, things like teaching, hospitality work, cleaning services, copywriting, transcription, and temp work, they're all falling apart at the same time. The new normal for the arts, it seems to me, depends as much as anything on finding ways to keep artists alive. Intellectual property rules that have separated physical and in-person work from its digitized or streaming versions are probably not the right fit anymore. We live in a world in which our physical spaces are digitally controlled. And at least for the moment, digital presentation is about all we've got. Those spaces are shaped by several things, intellectual property among them. This is an, this is an opportunity for the arts. Physical distancing rules means we have to think not only about individual or small performances, but also individuals and small audiences. What does that look like from an artist's perspective? How will artists collectivize? What do artists and technicians need from the from IATSE or the Screen Actors Guild now and in the future? Some of our biggest arts presenting organizations in this country, things like museums, symphonies, operas, and such, seems to me they've been trying to attract younger audiences for forever. But this moment flips that. In order to, spe to be seen anywhere now, you have to fit onto a digital platform, whether it's YouTube or Twitch or Instagram. In other words, it's no longer in this moment about trying to invite young people to your performance space, but about fitting your performances into young people's attention spaces. Congratulations, we're all at the kids' table now. What an opportunity to learn. On that note, artists will be tempted to, and they may already have, be putting, uh, be putting their lives and their livelihoods onto GoFundMe, Patreon, and YouTube. This is a bad idea. Look no further than the news industry or nonprofits to see why. These platforms will eat the arts alive. Can there be a collective effort toward a different outcome? Can all the museums and libraries and performance and presenting organizations and all the art nonprofits and creative industries and artists come together to create their own collectively owned digital infrastructure, a public digital infrastructure for the arts to use what exists now as an on-ramp, but build one for artists themselves and take the audiences with you. That's a possibility. Many people are getting to know place and space and time and sound in different ways than before. I think these are the raw materials of dancers, painters, musicians, and actors. And I can't wait to see what the artists have to show us. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on these ideas and perhaps provoke your thinking a bit. I look forward to the discussions.